You know, early in life, I had a really good lesson taught to me. I grew up in Temple Terrace, which is a little suburban area outside of Tampa. I grew up in the 60s, and uh, I had the best PE coach in the whole wide world, Coach Al Barnes. Now, in the 60s, for anyone who's about my age, you remember that PE was really something. Like, you had to run around the hot sun and climb ropes, not know how you're going to get down basically do all the things that are outlawed today. <laughs> and, I mean, we even drank water out of a garden hose. Okay, right? Remember that? Yeah. Well, I had this great PE coach, Coach Al Barnes. Now, I didn't know it at the time because, I, you know, this was like 1968, 1969. I was about 10 years old. I did not realize that Coach Al Barnes was integrating our all-white school. Okay, it was lost on me that he was African American. All I knew was that Coach Barnes was the greatest guy I had ever met. And he pushed us, he always pushed us to be even better. Stopwatch timed us, right? We had the Olympics every year, all kinds of awards. I loved him. I'd go home, no matter what my parents would say, I'd say, that's not what Coach Barnes says. And at the end of every week, Coach Barnes would put three cinder blocks on the basketball court. And whoever ran the fastest got to stand on one of the cinder blocks, and they would get a little paper thing around the neck, and everyone would applaud. And one day I said to Coach Barnes, I said, Coach Barnes, how come only boys are on the cinder blocks? And he said, Miss Iorio, they run faster than the girls. And that was the end of that. So, I went home, and, and after school, I would practice with my dad. He got out the stopwatch, and we would practice running. I would just run. Have any of you ever tried to run faster? I mean, you know, you want to mentally. It's like, my legs just need to move <laughs> faster, right? It doesn't really work that way. And I do not know how long this took me, because I'm, this is a memory that goes back 40 year, 40 plus years, but, but I practiced all the time. And there came a Friday afternoon at River Hills Elementary that I was one of the three individuals on the cinder blocks. I must have run faster than the slowest boy. <laughs> now, years later, uh, Coach Barnes and I became very close friends. And he got to see me elected mayor. He was really proud. He passed away three years ago. We were very close. We were having lunch back about a, 10 years ago. I said, Coach Barnes, I want to thank you for teaching me a very important lesson at River Hills back in the 60s. He said, you taught me how to compete without making excuses. Now, when you really think about what Coach Barnes could have said to me that day, well, he could have done a whole bunch of things, right? He could have said, well, Miss Iorio brings up a good point. Next week, I'll have a fourth cinder block for the fastest girl. That would not have been an outlandish thing to do because girls and boys do have different capabilities when it comes to sports. So that could have been an acceptable thing for him to have done. Or he could have done what is in vogue today, right? He could have said, oh, wow, we have a self-esteem problem going here. All right. Don't want Miss Iorio to feel badly about herself. So we'll just rotate everyone through, right? Because everyone's a winner. Yes, everyone gets a paper thing around their neck, right? Oh, boy. That would have been bad. I said, Coach Barnes, you taught me a fundamental lesson that I've carried with me my entire life. And that is when you compete, it's with yourself. So many people make that mistake. They think that competition is about the next person. And it's not, is it? Competition is about how fast you run. It has nothing to do with how fast the person next to you is running. And Coach Barnes taught me that very, very important lesson at an early age. And I was able to thank him for it. He remembered that story too believe it or not, albeit from a slightly different perspective, you can imagine. Later in life, I ran for the county commission. I ran when I was 25, got elected when I, right after my 26th birthday. And um, I learned a lot of lessons early on. I acted in ways in my 20s that I don't act today. 
We all do. Early on, I, if someone uh, disagreed with me or said mean things, newspapers said ugly things, colleagues said, my colleagues said ugly things, generally uh, people just, you know, you're in politics, people aren't, aren't going to like you. I have to confess to all of you that back then in my 20s and maybe even into my early 30s, I would actually hold a grudge. And I would build up a head of steam. And when I would see some people at a function, a reception, and they had been mean to me, I would think, I, I think I'm going to glare at them, you know? <laughs> Maybe I might even let them know that I don't like them. And so, and one day I was reading a book by Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela, as you know, had, was held captive for 27 years, right? He didn't do anything wrong. And so later, when he was released, he, he forgave his captors. And he wrote in this book, he said, I, he was talking about forgiveness, and he said, forgiveness liberates the soul. I remember closing this book and thinking, now let me get this straight. Nelson Mandela is forgiving people who took away his freedom for 27 years, and I can't forgive some person who disagreed with me about an issue on the county commission that I don't even remember what the issue is, or was, right? Is there something wrong with this? And then I concluded that I needed to liberate myself and my soul, and that in order to become the best straightforward leader, I had to actively practice forgiveness. And I have concluded that actively practicing forgiveness and holding no grudges is a key component of effective leadership. If you work in an office with 50 people and you can't stand five of them and you actively avoid them and hold grudges, then you work with 45 people, right? You don't work with 50 people. And if you multiply that out throughout your life, you're not leveraging all your relationships. Your world shrinks instead of expands. And when I became mayor and realized that my attitude every day had a lot to do with the attitude of the whole community, because you don't want your mayor showing up and being a downer, right? I mean, you want your mayor to be the most upbeat person in the room. You want them to be the, the person that you look to who says, I just ran into the mayor, right? Yes. And so I could hold no grudges. And I wake up liberated every day because of it. The other day I saw this congressman on Morning Joe, Peter King. He represents Long Island. You all know who he is? Yeah, he gets on, he talks. And, uh, <laughs> and he was talking. And he was saying, I, stop me short. I said, holy cow. He said, I'll never forgive my colleagues Never, not as long as I live. For they didn't, the funding for Hurricane Sandy didn't come through as fast enough. I'll never forgive them as long as I live. I thought, oh, okay, leadership, right? Anyone want him to be the CEO of your company? I'll never forgive? I've come to see forgiveness as a really, really important part of leadership. Now, us women have, have sometimes issues with recognizing what we have to offer. Uh, I don't know why that is. Women I know are the most talented people in the whole world. They just have a hard time saying it and acting that way sometimes. I got into the mayor's race in 2003 really late. I had been the supervisor of elections and we were transferring to touchscreen, and I wanted to make sure it had been done right, so I had said I wasn't going to run for mayor. And then when the election was over with, people said, you ought to run for mayor. I said, I can't run for mayor. They're already, you know, the race was already, people had been running for a year. There were three guys that had been running for a year. Tied up all the support. And my children at that time were in middle school. And I really worried about the effect of me running for mayor and being in such a high-profile position, what kind of effect that would have on them. 
And so I debated it and ruminated about it, and I said, I'm just not going to run for mayor. Forget about it. And people said, well, this is your opportunity. I said, no, I don't think I can do it. No, my children, my job, this, that, right? Sound familiar? Can't do it. So the election's in March, and this was December, and I had decided not to do it. I was okay with that decision. I got a phone call one night. It was from some guy in the community. I had known him forever. He wanted to have a talk with me. You see, he didn't know that I had already decided not to run. I'd only told my husband and a few close friends. He thought I was actually thinking of running. So he got on the phone with me and he said, Pam, you know, I understand you're thinking of running and I'm just calling to warn you not to do it. <laughs> I said, oh, really? Okay, why would that be? Well, you'll just ruin your career. You'll ruin, you've had such a good career. You're just going to ruin it. He said, there are three people in the race and one of them is the, is the you know, got all the support of the power structure. He's already raised $600,000, which was true. He had already raised $600,000 and has all the support. And really, Pam, he said, the race has already been decided. Just to put this in some perspective for you, I was the supervisor of elections at the time. <laughs> all right? <laughs> Golly! Mm, kind of gets under your skin a little bit. The, the race has already been decided. And I said, okay, thank you, thank you. I, I appreciate the advice. The adv I'm, I'm doing this because I care about you. Got off the phone. Mark, my husband, I, oh, you and I need to have a talk. He goes, what is it? I said, I'm running for mayor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't you hate to be told you can't do something? <laughs> now, I won't pretend that the race was easy. I got in on January 6th. The election was March the 4th, OK? I was the last person in. And my mentor and best friend, Fran, we had to quickly put together a campaign. She, I still remember she gave me a list of, of 20 names. Go visit these business leaders. Ask for their support. I took that little legal pad with me. I dutifully went to all of them. All men, 20 no's, 20. I'd already, I was pretty well known. I'd been in public life for 18 years. They all said, oh, Pam, you're the nicest. You're great. You're great. I'm sorry, we can't support you. Next person, you're fantastic. You're wonderful. Can't support you. Next, oh, I think you ought to be governor. Can't support you for mayor. Oh, the, <laughs> good. I went back to, I gave the list to Fran. I said, any more great ideas? And she said, well, here's the good thing, Pam. Whether or not you're successful has nothing to do with those 20 people. It has to do with the thousands of people who live in Tampa who think you ought to be mayor. And you know, I learned something so important in those months. First of all, it's easy to have self-doubt. I don't care what you've achieved in life. It's easy to let that self-doubt creep in and stop you from taking the next step. It's easy to say, I can't do something. My children, my husband, my parents, my this, my that, my fine. It's so easy to let that self-doubt creep in. The other thing I learned was that, you know what? The more someone says no to me, the more I'm just going to go out there and get it done. And I think a lot of women are that way. We're used to a lot of people saying no to us. We're used to a lot of people saying, you're fantastic, but no, you're not going to get the job. <laughs> you're great, but you're not getting that promotion. And all it really did for me is make me work all the harder to succeed. I found that I had to dig deep and believe in myself to find that leadership that I had within myself and let it out. Now I like to talk about leadership because I see it in people. Leadership has nothing to do with title. It has to do with what you have within yourself, your ability to lead yourself well. And in doing so, you can do great things in life. Believe in yourself and your capabilities. The more someone closes the door, the more you're going to push 
and open that door for yourself. Find that leadership that you have within yourself and go forward and do great things. Thank you very much. <laughs>